Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and I thought today it would be cool to do a video taking a look at the final optimized best variant of the Bergman uh, automatic pistol system. Uh, the first Bergman pistols came out as really quite early. Uh, the very first ones were 1893 and 1894, and the original guns were actually blowback uh, actions. They're really distinctive looking, they're a really cool example of one of the early automatic pistols. And uh, the, the blowback guns were decently successful, but of course they had to be chambered for a fairly, uh, a fairly weak set of cartridges because they were blowback, and that didn't attract a lot of military attention. And so by about 1900, Bergman had uh, come up with a new locking system. Actually, I should say the whole time Bergman was the financier and the manufacturer of these guns, the actual uh, engineering and design was done by Louis Schmeisser. So by around 1900, 1897 actually I think is the first one, uh, Schmeisser put together a locked breech system that allowed them to chamber these pistols for much more potent cartridges. And that evolved ultimately into the Bergman 1903, which got a, a fairly big order from the Spanish military. That was also called the Bergman Mars. And then the Danish military also ordered them in 1910. And the Danish order was the last significant military purchase of the guns. And in fact, this is a 1910 model like the Danes would have ordered. However, uh, the Bergman system lived on with the uh, Piper or Pipier, I'm not entirely sure which pronunciation is correct, uh, factory in Belgium that bought the rights to build these guns. And in the 1920s, they decided to try and give it like one last hurrah and uh, attract some military attention to the guns again. So, you know, they invested a lot in setting up production and they'd like to get more out of that investment. So they actually did a lot of tinkering with the gun and changed a lot of the small features on it. Of course, you can see here that they added an extended 15 round magazine. Uh, you may be able to see from back here that they added an adjustable tangent sight to the gun, but they did a number of other small changes that we'll take a look at up close in just a moment. Ultimately, this gun was kind of shopped around to a lot of militaries in the 1920s, but doesn't appear to have been substantially tested by anyone. Um, I know they were hoping to sell it to the French and that didn't pan out. Um, unfortunately for them, by the mid-1920s, this pistol was really obsolete. Uh, at that point, people had figured out this idea of putting the magazine in the grip of the gun, which makes things a lot more compact and a lot better balanced, and that was the way that everybody was going. However, it's cool to look at this as an example of the best optimization that you could get out of the Bergman system. So why don't I bring the camera back here and let's take a closer look at these little details that were changed. All right, so just at first glance, let's take a look at a couple of the obvious features. Biggest one is the magazine has been replaced with this extended magazine. This has witness holes that go down to 15, and there are matching witness holes in the magazine well here. So from one all the way down to 15, you know exactly how many rounds you've got left in the magazine. Um, this is still in 9mm Bergman, um, which is the, the standard cartridge they use. Pretty ballistically, yeah, just slightly less potent than today's 9 Parabellum. Uh, but it was definitely a viable military cartridge at the time. Now, now a few of the other changes that we will take a look at are the different shape of the trigger guard, relocation of the magazine catch, the replacement of the rear sight with a big tangent sight, a redesign of the hammer and also the bolt, and a substantial redesign of the disassembly method uh, for the bolt there, and a slightly lengthened barrel compared to the standard 1910. So, that covers all the, really the, the main changes that were made to this gun. Uh, I guess the grip panels as well, although that's not, not quite so mechanical. Point out, this is serial number one of this pattern, and it is so marked on pretty much all of the components. All right, let's get into our comparison. The trigger guard, first up, you can see that this has been reshaped. Um, you actually kind of have a smaller trigger guard on this one. Whether this ties into an internal mechanical change, I am not entirely sure. Um, our magazine release has also been changed and very much for the better. On the 1910 Bergman, the magazine catch is located here in the front of the trigger guard. And push that in and remove the magazine. And this is a really kind of a terrible magazine location. It's nice and simple mechanically and it's easy to make, but it is not an easy magazine um, it's not easy to actually operate in the field. 
part of the problem is it's a very stiff spring and it's kind of difficult to operate with your trigger finger and the magazines don't generally drop free. Normally they're kind of sticky. And so you have to have a second hand to pull it out. But then it really works better if you can grab it here, but then it's tricky to, to get good leverage on the magazine. Not a good system. What they went to on this last 1920s gun is really much superior. This is a catch that you simply push up and it releases the magazine. Uh, the magazine catch, by the way, is located in a similar position, but not quite identical. You can see there, same style of, of uh, locking open area, uh, but on the, the 1910 magazine, it's located much higher than on the, the 1920s gun. Uh, one of the other problems with this magazine catch system is that after you've popped the magazine catch out of that locking hole, it's still, unless you put a lot of pressure on it, it's still dragging on the magazine as you try to extract it, which is why they often don't really, in a, as a practical matter, they don't drop free. Um, once you get to here, then it's free, but from here all the way in, the magazine catch is dragging. On this one, there's a lot less force being exerted on the magazine, and it really is a much simpler system to remove. Um, the magazine walls on this were also thickened up. This is a more durable magazine. Um, certainly a good idea, a good change to make for military purposes. So one pretty basic change here, the, the barrel has been lengthened on this trials gun. Um, it looks to me like the method of assembly or manufacture of the barrel has also been changed. On the 1920s gun, we have a locating pin here, and I suspect they simplified the manufacture and the fitting of the barrel compared to the 1910s. That'd be a good way to reduce the cost of the guns. The hammer profile has been changed. See, the 1920s gun has a much wider hammer. It's uh, a lot easier to get a good grasp on, especially if your hands are wet or muddy or otherwise, or cold, for example, or otherwise not in ideal conditions. That's a good change. Now, the most significant mechanical change is a change to the disassembly method. So on these, the firing pin is located within the bolt here, and on the 1910, what you actually have to do is pull out the center section of this round piece. It pops out. You can see our firing pin in there, um, which acts as a guide rod for the recoil spring. To get that out, you have to push out the center of this piece and then do some other things to remove the bolt. On the 1920s gun here, they changed this to really to be the same as the disassembly method for the broom handle Mauser, where instead we now have a, a keyed guide rod uh, slash firing pin. You put a screwdriver in, rotate that 90 degrees, and then it comes out. So a substantial change to the, the method there. They also added a tangent rear sight. This now adjusts out to 500 meters, should you want to shoot that far. Um, with a shoulder stock, you'd be better able to do that, although 500 meters is still very optimistic. Um, the sights themselves are a rear notch and front post. So the actual sight picture didn't really change, but the construction of the sight did. All in all, as far as the Bergman goes, this is, I think, all a really good set of design changes, and it really would have been, or was, the best iteration of the Bergman as a military pistol. Now, was it the best military pistol for someone to choose in the 1920s? Nope, definitely not. Um, it really was obsolescent at that point, and so it's not really surprising that nobody adopted it. It's a little disappointing, because it'd be really cool if there had been a large military order for these, so that there might be some surplus ones out there um, and available to us today, instead of having uh, literally, I think only this one example existing. Um, the new grips on this are significantly wider than the original Bergman grips and actually feel quite good in the hand. This would probably be a very, very fun gun to shoot, uh, although not as effective as a more modern pistol like, say, a Browning High Power. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Being a uh, serial number one pistol of not more than just a couple ever being made. Uh, it's not the sort of thing that turns up every day to take a look at. It was really cool to be able to check this one out and show you guys all the, the fine details on it.
If you enjoy this sort of content, please consider stopping by my Patreon page. Uh, a buck a month donation can really go a long way in helping uh, me to be able to continue doing this full time and bringing really cool test trials guns like this to you guys. Thanks for watching.